Are you ready to roll? This is live? Well, the place is definitely alive. So good evening, folks. Welcome to the MTC on this very special evening. As you're all aware, tonight's evening actually is sponsored, inspired by IVO, which is an organization that is headed here in Montreal, correct? And it stands for Israeli Victims of War. And I will allow and invite Richard Dermer, who is on the board of IVO and one of its president. president. Oh, I'm sorry. So driving forces clearly to tell us about, I let me guess you're on the board too. Okay, yes? No, but you're going to be. <laughs> he was, I know some connection there. Okay. So I'll invite Richard Dermer to please tell us about Ivo and tell us about how this very special evening with Tamar came about. Friends, a warm welcome for Mr. Richard Dermer. How do you do? Okay, I may need your help with Tamar. Thank you, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we're incredibly glad that so many people have turned out. We're up here because we wanted to make sure this is the best, best air-conditioned part of the building. So that's how, we're, that's how we ended up here. And glad to see that we have such a, a great turnout. So um, just a few words about IVAO. I just, a magazine, where's the magazine? If you don't have one of these already, they're outside. So before the end of the night, if you don't have one already, or if you haven't received one in the mail, Please make sure you take one outside. That'll tell you a lot more about IVAO and what we do. Um, so IVAO is a program. Uh, I'll give you a very, very brief uh, history that started over 30, about 30, almost 35 years ago. It was inspired by the idea that after the Yom Kippur War in 1973, the idea would be that there was, the idea was to give a gift to those families who had suffered through military service. If you remember, in the Yom Kippur War, there was over 2,000 soldiers killed. There were thousands of soldiers that were injured. And in the mid-1980s, the kids of those soldiers were becoming sort of bar and bat mitzvah age. So the idea was, what could we do for those kids? And this idea emanated out of Montreal that they would create a program that would sort of that would be a gift to these families to help them and give them some kind of um, some kind of respite from their the difficult lives that were created from their being affected by war. Um, and so IVAO was born, which has has changed slightly over the years in terms of the way it's formatted during the summer. But essentially, it's a one month program where kids come from Israel, primarily bar and bat mitzvah age, between 12 and 14. And they get to spend three weeks in a summer camp, and then filing, follow, uh, following the three weeks in a summer camp, then they get to, um, we take them on a trip between Montreal, Ottawa, and Toronto. Um, and then they go home from Toronto, so they're in Canada for a full month. Uh, since the, since the, um, since obviously there was the Yom Kippur War, and then of course events kept taking place in Israel that kept IVAO populated with kids over the last 30 years. After the Yom Kippur War, it was the first Lebanon War, then there was the first Intifada, the second Lebanon War, the second Intifada, the Gaza Wars. So I think we all understand that over the years, uh, there still, they're still unfortunately are kids that are from families in Israel who suffer just for the fact that they happen to live in Israel. I mean, I think that's something we all recognize in IVAO, that these families and these kids suffer simply because they happen to live in Israel. Whether, it's, it, whether these families have suffered a loss or injury through a terrorist attack, whether they have been injured while serving in the IDF. And so that's the idea, to help these families and to give these ki kids a, a memorable, a meaningful experience. I just want to, because it's, it's, it's very present to us, the whole IVAO program um, was founded by the Borek family. And for those of you who don't know, I never knew Moish Borek personally, who had founded the program. But I wanted to, I just want to acknowledge, some of you may know this, that Moish Borek and his two sisters, Evelyn and Molly, um, they both happened to all pass away in the last year. 
So the whole original IVAL generation, unfortunately, have passed away in the last year. I just want to acknowledge that Moisha's son, Aaron, is here with us. Here he is. He's very, he's very shy and humble, Aaron. But we can, we can count on Aaron for anything. Aaron grew up, literally, Aaron grew up with IVAL. And if not for his family, this program wouldn't exist. And uh, so we're, we're, we're doing some long-term initiatives to honor the Boric family. You'll see some of it in, in this magazine. But everyone in this community uh, uh, and all the Israeli kids and families over the year um, owe a huge debt of gratitude for the Boreks who, who ran this program over many, many years. Um, today in IVAL, uh, we continue to grow in the sense that we have more and more kids. Uh, we've, been networking, we've been networking with both the Terror Victims Organization and the Disabled Veterans Organization in Israel. So this year, I'm proud to report and announce that we will have 107 kids coming to Canada in the next two weeks. Those kids, most of them, uh, there's a group of them, the core group of 72 kids are part of the Bar and Bat Mitzvah program. Just so you know, we have another program now called Dive Out Plus, where some of the kids and the families have had such an amazing experience that they want to send their kids back again. Um, we, we allow them to come back, uh, where we, we, we invite them to come back. When they come on IVAL, they're hosted by this community. They're fully hosted by this community. And we can't say enough about our partner camps, Camp in Abrith, YCC, and Camp Masad, that host all these kids for the first three weeks. The, what those camps do, as well as um, other institutions in the community, such as the Torah Center, which hosts the kids for, a, for Shabbat meals. We have the Shar Zion, which hosts 70 of our kids for a Shabbat meal. We have the Beth Tikva community, who hosts our Shomer Shabbat kids. This IVAL program is really a Montreal community effort that everyone should be incredibly proud of. Um, so our IVAL Plus kids, the older kids, they're invited back. We love them to come back. We get them a special. The camps give us a special discounted rate so that they can come back and join us again. So between our 72 Bar and Bat Mitzvah kids and then some 14 and 15 year olds, our count is at 107 kids this year. So I hope a lot of you during, whether it's at the Torah Center, at the Shah Zion, at Beth Tikva, or wherever we are in Montreal when we're here, I hope a lot of you get a chance to meet the kids because meeting the kids is something very, very special which maybe we'll say a bit about after uh, later on as we close the evening. So, we are incredibly pleased to have our guest speaker tonight, Tamar Weinberg. Tamar and, and myself and Tamar's family have become very close over the last three years. We see each other all the time in Israel when, we're, when I'm visiting Israel. And we're also very pleased to have Tamar's sisters and her mother are here with her. And brother, sorry, Ram, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sisters and brother, Ram. So, Ram. Ran, sorry, what did I say? Sorry, I got to... Um, so, they, they've also joined Tamar here in Montreal. So, I will just... I know Tamar will introduce herself in a sense, so I don't have to do too much of an introduction, but only to say that Tamar um, is... Uh, her son, Daniel, who she'll mention, this is his fourth year here in Montreal with us. Daniel is one of these kids that was so taken with what we do in IVAL that he keeps coming back on our IVAL Plus program. And we visited with Daniel yesterday at the Y Country Camp. He's here for the whole summer as a CIT. So the Weinberg family has become a real part of our, uh, part of our close family. And uh, we're incredibly uh, pleased that they are. So without, uh, I think we'll just invite Tamar up. And we'll invite Tamar to share her incredible story of being uh, the survivor of a terror attack. Okay, we have to put this on. Yes. Sorry, everyone. We're not that high tech here. Maybe we can put on the scarf. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, 
first of all, I want to say I'm a little excited, of course. And I, I don't remember myself speaking to so many people for a long time. And I'm not a uh, professional speaker, so, and I might have some words in English running away, so uh, I hope you'll excuse me. Um, and I want to say, please ask me. If you have questions, it even helps me to speak. So don't wait until the end and so on. So just ask, and then it goes fluently and nice, OK? So now I will, t I will tell about myself a few words. Um, <clears throat> I, I grew up in a kibbutz in Israel. Uh, everybody knows what a kibbutz is, OK? Um, I'm, I'm uh, 56 today. Um, when I was a child, we never traveled with our parents abroad or things like this. And uh, when I was uh, after, after the army, I, uh, I uh, stayed for about a, wee, a year in the kibbutz, and then I uh, worked, saved money, and I was planning on going uh, to travel in the Far East for a long trip with my backpack and my on my back and uh, have all this uh, fun. And uh, um, I, I met a, a friend. I mean, she wasn't, I didn't know her before, but she was my companion for the trip, a girl from another kibbutz, my age more or less. We were 24 about, about then. And um, um, we took a boat from Israel to Athens. And in Athens, we had about a week. We, we wandered around. We found the tickets to, to, to fly to Bangkok. Um, and um, and um, it was supposed to be a flight, a night flight from Bangkok, from Athens to Cairo, including a stayover in a hotel. And in the next morning, a flight to, to Bangkok. Um, and we went up on, on the airplane, and uh, the flight started. And about uh, 15 minutes after we took off, suddenly I see, I see a man raising up and uh, going to the front of the airplane. And he's holding in one hand a pistol and in the other hand a grenade. And I was looking. At, and he was speaking Arabic. And I didn't understand what he, what he said. And I thought to myself, oh, what a strange flight. Tomorrow, I'm going to, I was sure it's, it's, a, it's a drill of the Egyptians. It was an Egyptian airplane, I forgot to say. Uh, I said to myself, tomorrow I would call my parents and tell them what a strange flight we had. But then a few minutes later, the stewardess uh, translated and she said, they said that uh, the plane was uh, hijacked uh, by the um, Egyptian uh, revolution organization. And if, no, if nobody moves, no one will harm. And uh, I was, at that time, I was listening to my Walkman. Uh, and immediately, I took it off. And me and my friend, we decided we will not speak Hebrew, because it was feeling uh, very unsafe. And uh, actually, we stopped speaking at all. And <laughs> of course, Henway tried to do our best not to be seen and not to be, it was clear that being Israelis on this airplane was not for our uh, best interest, but we didn't know what's going to happen. And they started doing a selection. They called each one of the passengers with his passport, which I also thought maybe I would hide my, my passport. But then I thought, oh, no, this would just cause troubles. So I didn't, you know. And um, they called each other of us, and they took the passport, and they, they put the Western passengers in one side of the airplane and the Eastern passengers in the other side. They made this selection. And um, we were seated uh, close to the, to the front with uh, some French and Americans near us. And, um, and then they were shooting on the airplane. And uh, the air masks fall down. And uh, what I've learned later is that one of the, the Egyptian um, security men on the airplane, when he was called to, to come to bring his, to give his passport, and he shut the, he shut the, 
the hijacker that stood there in the front with, with a pistol and, uh, and no, he was not with this anymore, but the one that was taking passports and everything. And this was very scary. And this told us that this is for real. I mean, it was like, uh oh. Um, after a while, we were sitting, you know, um, they put four people in, a, in, a, in seats of three, and we were like this with the masks and everything. And um, we didn't know where, where we were heading. After uh, two hours, more or less, after they collected all the people and changed seats and whatever, um, we landed. And it was a emergency. Yeah. Bec we, la we landed and we didn't know where it was, but the, the tarmac was dark. Um, and then, um, and then um, some cars came. We landed in a remote uh, uh, tarmac, and um, um, they started calling some um, Filipino women. They said, one Filipino woman, please, I think there was no please, but <laughs> come over. The, the, the stewardess called, and uh, the women came. And they, they, we could hear them telling her, go down and to the right. And they, we could see from the windows that there were cars and they were uh, taken away, these women released. Um, I was, the song I was listening, the last song I was listening when I was still listening to my music was in a very famous Israeli song that says, to whom who doesn't believe it's hard this year. And I took this sentence, it kept going in my head and it, for me, it was the, the side of the hope. I have to believe. If not, it will be hard. I have to believe and it will be okay. And uh, so when they called these women and they told them to go down, I thought, oh, maybe they release. Maybe, you know. So when they finished releasing these women, they said in the same uh, tone and the same words, they said, one Israeli come, come ahead. And um, my friend, she was sitting more close to the aisle. So I said to her, go. She said, no, I can't. I have a headache. I have a stomach ache. She was, she was reacting to the, to the stress. And um, she said, you go. So I said, OK, somebody has to go. If, when they're calling, somebody has to go. So I went. And as I was, I, I came to the, to the front near the door. And I was waiting for somebody to tell me, OK, like I heard they, tell, they told the other, uh, go down and to the right. But nobody says anything. And then I see the hijacker stands run right in front of me. I was standing by the, by the door. I was actually standing. Uh, there, was a, there was a car with stairs that was brought to the airplane. So the car has a, a platform up there and then the stairs. So I was standing on the platform. And the hijacker was like a meter in front of me, and I was waiting for somebody to say something. And then so he was with a mask, the black mask, and just I could only see his eyes. And then suddenly I see he's raising his hand, and I realize he's not going to release me. He's going to shoot me. And in, in a second, I don't know, in, as an instinct, I turned around with my face to the, to the stairs, and he shot, and the bullet, the bullet came in from, from the back of my ear here and went through the ear and lodged here on my, on my cheek. And later, I, it, it stayed here. What happened was that they, they took out some of the gunpowder from the bullets because they were afraid the bullets would make a hole in, in the airplane's body, which, which did happen. I didn't know by, by then. but. Uh, so the bullets, which were originally were nine millimeter, which is a very strong bullet, uh, were very were very weak, and the bullet stayed here. It didn't came out of under my skin. And I fall down on the on the platform, and he went in back, closed the door, and stayed inside. And after a few minutes, I understood I'm I'm alive, and I I, I could see the door was closed. I didn't know where I was. I, in my mind, I was sure it's one of the hostile Arabic countries. And, and I thought to myself that uh, 
I'm going to be sitting in jail now for, for years. Nobody will know where am I. And, and, um, but since the door was closed, I, I went down the stairs. And there was nothing. They, after they took these uh, 20 Filipino women, they just went away. You could imagine in a situation like this, there would be ambulance, police, army, um, fire uh, fighters, whatever. Nothing and nobody. And then the hijacker saw me from the airplane going down, and he opened the door and he ran after me again. And when I saw that, since there was nobody and nowhere to hide, I crawled under the stairs of, the, of this car, of the stairs I crawled down. And he came also, and he bent it down like this, and he shot me from like this. He shot me again, and this bullet came in my butt and lodged in, in my pelvis and stayed inside there. And from that moment, <clears throat> I decided I'm not moving, I'm not going anywhere, and I lay down there. And this was the end of November. I, I can tell you it was Malta, which is Europe more or less, and it was uh, one at night, and it was very cold. It started raining later. I was all soaking wet. It was later on. It was even there was even hail, and I was freezing, and I was laying down there and uh, trying to hit myself to hit to hit myself to warm up, and then I hear another shotgun, and then I, I made myself look like I'm dead. And after a few minutes, I looked to the side and I could see and I saw my friend laying down nearby. I was under the stairs and she was nearby. And um, what I've been told later is that after me, they called her. They said, another Israeli, come. But what happened is that the whole airplane saw, heard, heard me being shot and saw me going down the stairs and, uh, and heard me being shot again. So, of course, my friend, when they called another Israeli, she didn't want to come. So she, she didn't come, and she was hiding and try, trying, and she was sitting and crying. And they looked for her with her picture between the passengers, and they found her, and they grabbed her. And eventually, they shot her straight in the head on the airplane. And she immediately became, she had a brain damage, a brain, she was uh, clinically dead immediately. And they threw her near the airplane from above. And what happened is that uh, the pilot told the terrorists that he is landing in Malta because he, has not, he doesn't have enough fuel. So they wanted to arrive to Libya. They were... They were belong to uh, Abu Nidal's organization. This was an organization that uh, separated from the PLO and declared war also on the PLO. He was one of the most extreme organizations. And they wanted, they wanted, uh, they, they did this, that uh, in order to get their friends out of jail, but also, um, they wanted to get to Libya, and this was an Egyptian airplane, so they, they wanted to make some mess between Libya and, and Egypt, which were not in good relationship anyway. So they demanded fuel, and they said, if we will not get more fuel to get to Libya, we will shoot a passenger every 15 minutes. But also, I've learned later that me and my friend, we were not part of this negotiation. They shot us just for the fun because we were Israelis. Later, they shot another three Americans. And uh, uh, I was laying down under the airplane and another three times, I, or two times, I heard shooting. And every time I was like making myself dead and then after a while freezing and trying to warm up and doing like this. At about four at night, and all the time, by the way, laying, laying down under the airplane, I kept hearing this song in my, in my ears and telling myself, I have to believe, it will be okay, I have to believe. And this really kept me strong in a way. And um, around four in the morning, after three hours there, 
they turned off the lights of the, of the tarmac because they wanted, the Egyptians brought um, force to storm the airplane. And they knew that there were bodies under the airplane. They saw them from the Migdal Pikuach. Uh, from the watchtower. Yeah. And uh, they wanted to collect the bodies before they start this operation. So they turned off the lights. And I, I, I must have fallen asleep or lost my conscience for, for a minute or so. And suddenly I see it's dark. So I told myself all the time, I knew it's not a good place to stay, but I, since it was also my first flight in my life, <laughs> by the way, you know, sitting and I told you, or I didn't, I told you we, we took a ship from Israel to, to Athens and then we, we bought the tickets. So it was my first flight in my life and I didn't know, I didn't know, for example, that if I just go to the other side of the airplane, they cannot open a window or something. I was afraid to go from there because I was afraid they would shoot me again. And, uh, but at four, at four in the morning, I, I thought, all the time I told myself, go away from here, but then where shall I go? I didn't know where I was. And when, at four o'clock, when they turned the lights off, and I knew it's going to be light, daylight soon, I decided I'm, I'm, now I'm going. So I, I reached my hand to my friend because when it started raining, she was moving. I guess it was nerves or I don't know. So I didn't know how badly she was injured. I thought maybe I can take, I can call her and she can come with me. But of course she didn't, she was too heavy. So I knew I have no chance. And I went, I crawled, I was laying down here. I crawled under the, the stairs and then under the body of the airplane and then out to the other side and and I went a little bit like like this so they don't see me from the airplane and and I went to the direction where I thought from some reason that the terminal will be there and then I saw two two cars standing by the side and I told myself, okay, I, I'm going to get in there just to warm up a little bit because I was frozen. And I got closer. And then the doors were open and some people came out. They were uh, Egyptian uh, Maltese security people who were watching. And immediately, and they saw me and I said, please don't shoot me. I ran away from the airplane. And they saw, I had a very short hair by the, that time and I had this bullet stuck here which I didn't know. I thought it was just a, a blood, um, yeah. I didn't know I had a bullet here. And um, so they put me in the car and they immediately took me and they say to me, what nationality? I said, I ran away from the river and they say, what nationality? And I said, I'm American. Because for me, it was clear. I thought I'm in Syria or Lebanon or wherever. I'm not going to say I'm Israeli. So, and I, I didn't have my passport on me. It was taken by the, by the hijackers. So they put me in the car and immediately drove very fast. And, and then the way they passed me to the, to the ambulance. And all the way, also when I, when I still, when I was on the airplane, I kept telling myself, I was, I was then 24, I came from the kibbutz. I felt like, how can it be me? Little Tamar Artsy from the kibbutz on my first flight in my life, this happens to me. How can it be? It's, it's, it's unbelievable. I knew people who flew once and more and hundreds of times. Nothing happens. How can it be? And, and then again, laying down in the, in the ambulance, and the ambulance is... And I, what am I doing here? It was so strange, so... And then we, uh, we arrived to the airport, to the, to the hospital. And they pushed me inside, and they're asking me again, uh, where are you from? And I said, I'm American. And they say, what is your name? Now, I, my name was Tamar Artsy. And I said, my name is Tommy Archie. Because <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, where are you from? I said, I'm from New York. So they said, what is the address? And I said, oh, that, that's enough. There's a limit to how much I can lie and get, <laughs> have problems with my lies later. So I said, I, I, this I can't say, I want to speak with the American ambassador. From, from some reason I was sure that there will be American ambassador wherever I go. And I thought when he comes I would 
whisper in, my, in his ear that I'm, that I'm Israeli and he should take care of me. Uh, so they said, okay, okay. And um, then they put me into surgery, take out the bullets. I had one here, one here. And I woke up in the, from the surgery in the next morning, 10 in the morning, and I see, uh, I see a policewoman sitting with her back near my bed. And I tell myself, that's strange. There must be a prisoner here that she is guarding. <laughs> of course, she was guarding me because they were afraid from some more action, some more aggressive action. From Just to, to make you understand, at that time in Malta, there was no Israeli embassy. There was a small consulate which in, who worked there was just a woman. She was the consul. And she had a man uh, helping a man who was her uh, security guard and his wife. They were one year younger than me. That was the whole consulate. And the PLO had five uh, different offices there. <clears throat> and the influence of Libya was very strong. And uh, there was an attempt to shoot. I mean, the, cons the, the, the consul was shot. The Israeli consul was shot by somebody. And then Israel decided to take, her, to take them out of there so that there will be no Israeli consulate in Malta at that time. And uh, <coughs> and. Um, That's okay, I have, I have another one. <laughs> <laughs> I have here enough. Anyway, no, I, Ashley, it's okay. Yes, yes, yes to that. Um, so, so they were guarding me. Uh, and then um, they came again and they asked me my name and where, where was I from. And then they asked me if I flew alone. And I said, no, I flew with a friend. And they said, and I said, she was laying down near me under, under the airplane. And they said, what was her name? And I thought to myself, OK, her name was Nitzan Mendelssohn. That's a Jewish name, but not an Israeli name. I can say that. So I said her name. And then they brought me her clothing. And they asked if, if these are her clothing so I can recognize her, so they would know who she is. And they told me that she was in a clinical, in a very bad situation, and she's in uh, intensive care. And again, they asked me, aren't you? No, they didn't ask if I'm Israeli, but they asked, where are you from? And I said, I'm American. And I said, when will the American ambassador come? And they said, soon, soon. And um, then comes a doctor, and he says, um, Hello, I'm a um, doctor and a choker, a investigator. investigator. I'm an investigator doctor. And uh, where are you from? And I said, I'm American. So he said, not Israeli? And I said, no. And I, kept, I kept telling myself, how do they know? How do they know? <laughs> now, first of all, I, I was naive. I, I didn't think, from some reason, I didn't think they have lists of passengers on the airplane. <laughs> By the way, now, a few months ago, my husband got into the internet and he found this list with our names circled. My name, my, my and my friend's name. I don't know who put it in, but it's unbelievable. You can find everything, you know, in the internet. And then, um, Oh, I forgot, I forgot a very important thing to, to say. When I just arrived to the, to the airport and they asked me who I was and what was my name and all that, I asked, where am I? And they said, you are in Malta. And from, I never heard of Malta before. I was 24, Malta yoke. I had no, and then I said, what language do you speak? They said, Maltese. Of course, this hel didn't help me at all. <laughs> but the Maltese, I don't know if you know, but this language is, uh, is combined from a few languages. Uh, I think it's English, uh, Italian, and Arabic or something like this. 
and and I, I was laying uh, under the, the Rentgen uh, camera, X-ray, and everybody was around me, and somebody was looking on me from up and say, Maskina. Maskina is like miskena in Hebrew, and it means poor thing. So I said to myself, okay, I'm not telling anybody I'm from Israel. They speak <laughs> Arabic. That's enough. So. Uh, when this uh, doctor uh, came and said, not from Israel, and so and so, I said, I said, can you show me a map? He said, what do you need a map for? I said, I want to know where am I. So he said, okay, I will draw you a map. And he took a piece of paper and he, he did like this. This is the Mediterranean, here is Italy, Sicily, Malta, Libya, and here is Israel. And I'm again, <laughs> I don't know nothing, it's not. Now another thing I didn't uh, another thing I forgot when we were before we took off in in Athens we uh, we met an American guy there he was a few years older than us and he was already a very uh, a traveler who traveled a lot and he was heading to Bangkok as well so we got friendly a little bit with him because we were going to land in Bangkok at 12 at night and we didn't want to be there alone and all of that now he, after us, after they, sh they shot us, they shot another two Americans. One woman was killed. After my friend Nitsan uh, didn't want to get up and all of that, they tied the Americans' hand with something and they were like this, the Americans. So um, they shot uh, the woman and she was killed immediately. And they called this American guy who was very, very tall two meters or something. And he, because he knew what's going to happen, he had another plan. He was not going to die just like this. And he was looking at the hijacker, and he was uh, like um, intimidating him. And he had a plan to kick him or something like this. And the hijacker, he, he realized that. So before this, this man's name was Patrick. Before Pat had a chance to do something, the hijacker shot him. But because he was so tall or something, his, the, the bullet just skimmed his, his head and, and he rolled on the stairs and ran away immediately. And he, no, there were, there were two, three. One was killed in the beginning and then there were two left. But there was one shooting us all the time. He was in the front. And uh, so this guy, Pet, arrived to the hospital three hours before me. And he told them that there are two Israelis laying down under the airplane. They were shot. So when I arrived to the hospital, they knew that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept asking, when does the American ambassador will come? And they told me, soon, soon. And then after, after this, I'm laying down in the bed. And suddenly, there is a young couple standing by my, my bed. She looks more or less like me, a little dark, small. And he looks very U European, um, pale and uh, with a suit. And they say to me in Hebrew, Shalom Tami. And I'm saying to myself, mm -mm. everybody can say Shalom. I'm not an answering this. I said, hello. <laughs> And they, they said in Hebrew, Anachno Shai Vedorit Meshagrirut Israelit, which is like, we are Shai and Dorit from the Israeli embassy. And then I believed them. And I said, oh, it was like, and this doctor was standing nearby and I said, I'm sorry I lied, but you know. And uh, from that moment, it was all much more simple. And uh, in the next morning, my parents arrived. And uh, I stayed in the hospital for another week. During that week, uh, now, now I'll tell you what happened in the meantime. The Egyptians stormed the airplane. They put some uh, explosive under the airplane. They put too much explosive. What, what happened was that these, it all flew into the airplane and the airplane started burning. The hijackers, when they realized something like this is happening, they started throwing grenades in, in the airplane. Very, very few people succeeded in getting out of this airplane. And then 
the Egyptians were laying down around with guns and shot the people who ran away because they said, maybe it's the hijackers. So, so many people were killed. Only altogether, I think, more or less, um, only 20 people survived from this. 60 died. 20 people were released before, and another 20 people somehow survived this. So I had a big luck not to be on the airplane when this happened. And um, where was I? <coughs> yeah. So, so, so the the hijacker that was shooting, he was shot. Also, he was shot by by the Egyptians, and he laid down in the hospital in, in intensive care, not very far away from my friend. And then, and then some of the passengers said, this is the one that shot all of us, because he was trying to behave like he's one of the passengers. So they caught him, and he, he recovered. And he was trialed in Malta. And I, after a week, my friend uh, passed away. And I was released from the hospital. And I came, we went, all went back to Israel, me and my parents. and and her parents. And um, about a year later, there was the trial of this hijacker in Malta. And I testified in Israel. I, uh, they wanted me to come to Malta. I said, I'm not coming to Malta. But it was possible by the Maltese law to testify in some other court and to send the testimony. So that's what I did. And he was sentenced to the maximum that was possible in Malta, that's 25 years in jail. But both, I guess, from, from political reasons and from because there was pressure from all the PLO uh, uh, and, uh, and Libyan and all of that, the, the Maltese uh, took off years from his uh, time when there was a uh, 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 Birthday to the queen, they took off seven years. When there was uh, Yom Atzmaut, they took off. And in the end, he was released after seven years. Then I was happy that there is the big brother, the Americans, uh, who sees themselves also a little bit as the police of the world. And they caught him. They caught him in Africa. It was a big operation of the FBI. And they brought him to the States. They, they had a rendition, and they brought him to the States. And they trialed him again. And um, to this trial, which was 10 years after the hijacking, I, I, had, I went. Because first of all, for me, it was easier to go to the States, and it was 10 years ago already. And because I couldn't, the American law didn't uh, it was not possible for me to testify in Israel. I had to be there. So I went, I went there, and I was in the same court with him, and I saw him, and I testified against him, and it was, it was very good. It was very hard, but very good. And he was, uh, he was sentenced to another 25 years. Um, because they couldn't charge him for, for killing and murdering because he was charged for that already before. They, so they charged him for um, air piracy and maybe some more little things. But um, these 25 years passed already, and he's, he's going to be released very soon, unfortunately. I already received a letter that there was a parole committee, and if I want to write something, and so and so. So I wrote something, but it's not going to help. Uh, um, I think that's uh, the main story. He was killed. Two were killed, yeah. And by the way, just one more thing about people said. We flew from Athens, and Athens back then was well known as a very unsafe uh, airport. But in this case, they caught these people in Athens. They were suspicious to them, and they checked them. They made them naked, to s and they didn't find anything. 
because they had help from inside. I don't know. I have no idea. Look, most of the people that were killed there, most of the people that were killed there and they didn't release them were Palestinians, were Arabs on their way to Egypt, were uh, from the Far East. There were just a very few Western people. There was one Canadian with her baby son from... Uh, What's it called? Uh, I'll remember in a few minutes. No, no, no. Uh, no, no. Three hours. No, because it's. It seems like, first of all, the adrenaline was working, and then it was also very, very cold. I was not ble bleeding, and I was, not, I, I was only in pain when the bullet came in. But after that, and I was very lucky because the bullet here didn't hurt anything inside, you know. Uh, I laid down in the hospital there for a week, and then I got released and, and went back home. And for a few more weeks, I was slow, and, but I, I, got, I was okay very soon. I mean, mentally, it took much longer. It took a long time until I got out of home. And I, until I, for example, I, I, came, I came and I stayed in my parents' home, which I've never stayed there because I grew up in a kibbutz where there was still sleeping in children's home. And I stayed in my parents' home for three weeks until I moved to my own place, which was a long time. <laughs> and, but in, in the beginning, I didn't go out of home, in the kibbutz. And then I remember one day I was sitting in front of friends, uh, friends' home on the grass, and the friends, uh, the friends came in for a minute, and then a, an Arabic worker passed, passed, and I said to myself, is he going to shoot me now? And then, and then, um, what happened later? It it was, it was a process, a long process, until I really started going out of the kibbutz and, and going alone. It was a process until I could believe I'm really not in danger. And for years, for years, I only flew El Al. It took me five years to fly again. Apart from coming back to Israel, which is also not easy, but Revivim. Ah, Revivim is in the south, in the Negev, on the way to Sdebuker after Be'er Sheva. In Revivim, picking. Yeah, we had pictures. Yeah, they were very good. We don't have them anymore, unfortunately. No. Yeah. Tell me what kind of help you receive from the Israeli government in terms of psychological help, because I'm sure there's long-term effects to, the, to what you experienced. Um, look, I was... In Israel, there is the social security, Bituach Lomi, and they they give uh, whatever is necessary. But since I was in the kibbutz, um, they asked me um, if I want uh, psychotherapy in the kibbutz, and I didn't. It took me half a year until I I said it's not that the, yeah, I didn't want. It took me half a year until I I came and said I want, and then. But look, at that time, there, was, there wasn't much um, experience with uh, uh, PTSD or, or thing like, things like this, which today are so well known and everybody, everybody knows what PTSD is? Okay. And therapy was not so developed by then about this. Uh, so when I said I want therapy, the kibbutz looked for me 
and they found a man who was, um, his expertise was with head injured people, which I wasn't really, because I wasn't hurt in my head, you know. But he, he was a, a psychologist and it was good enough for the beginning. And I was in therapy for half a year, and then after a while, they went again. And during the year, slowly, slowly, I did whatever was necessary. Yeah. I have another Look, first of all, I think I was very lucky because, look, I, I was unlucky to be, in the, to be there on my first flight of my life. But once I was there, I was very lucky. And by the way, it's like I'm always saying, I don't know if to be angry with God for letting me be there or, or say thank you for letting me out of there. And... When I was on the airplane, I was playing, I was, I'm not a religious person, I've never been, but I was talking to God. Because when you are in such a, such a, such a situation, you don't say, mom save me, dad save me. You speak to God. So, but um, my, my, uh, my, I was lucky because my body, first of all, I had this song in my head that, kept me hoping, but my body reacted. My friend, I, I heard from her family after that, because we're in touch all these years, that when they are in stress, they all react with, with stomach ache, with headache. It's, so that's what happened to her. She was more realistic than me. To believe, to be naive enough to think they would release me, this is stupidity. Why, why should they release me? She was very realistic, and that's why she was in panic. But, me, for some reason, I don't know. Look, I've been hearing from many soldiers. People came to me later and said, you are a hero. And I said, but every soldier is facing things like this in Israel, war. And, but they said, no, but every soldier knows he has the whole army behind him. And usually they have a gun. And you know, I was, but I don't know. I think it's thanks to my parents and I don't think it has anything to do with the army. My friend was in the army too. <clears throat> what was the other question? Oh, um, when the, oh, well, the talk went to the media eventually, right? Um, I was just wondering if they had approached you at any time <coughs> to speak or be on a news show, something. All the time. Look, it was, it was a lo it's a long story because what happened is before my parents arrived, of course, in the hospital there were lots of journalists. They didn't let them approach. There were immediately, after this happened, there were two journalists, one from Yediot Achronot and one from Ma'ariv, the two big uh, newspapers. But they were from Europe and they came. And one of them, actually the woman, I, on the day my parents were supposed to arrive, and I was waiting for them and waiting, and I was very, she wrote me a note. She said, I know your parents are coming. So, and she gave it to one of the guards, uh, to, and she wanted to come in. And after she wrote me this note, I said, yes, I want to talk to her. Because I thought she's bringing me some great news. My parents are down here, and they'll be here in a minute. No, she knew that they're on, my way, on their way, just like I knew. She was manipulating already by then. And after, after my parents came, and. They, the, the journalists came, and there were these two journalists standing by, by, by my bed all day, coming and going. And they were, they were not very nice. And very quickly I realized they were treating me as, as an uh, object, an object and something, something that has to be told and not as a person. Uh, another thing was that my parents, when they were told that me and my friend were there, they were, to were told not to talk to journalists because the, the Ministry of uh, Foreign in Israel still didn't know if there are more Israelis on the airplane or not, and they were told to keep it quiet. When they arrived to the airport in the morning, when they flew to Malta with the family of my, of my friend, suddenly 
somebody is calling the father of my friend or the family. So they went urgently because they, and then there was, there, there was a journalist. He said, I just wanted, I didn't know who you are. So I called, think about how, how uh, insensitive. So, and then these two journalists kept pressuring me to give them a picture. I didn't feel comfortable in, in my pajama and picture. But, so I didn't want it. But then my parents says, you know, at that time there was no mobile phone. There was no, you know, our friends at home, they want to see you too. Give them a picture. So I said, okay. So one of them, I don't even remember who was it, was there. And he got the picture. Then the other one came and said, why did you give him before me? <laughs> then I came back home. We, we landed at 5. I arrived in my kibbutz at 7. And I wanted to meet my family and my friends. But they arranged a, a journalist party because they said all the, if you don't speak to all of them, then they would nag you, one of, each one of them would come and it would be, so I had to, to meet them before and there was a big, at that time there was only one channel in the, in the television and they were there and they wanted to put, to put me in the news that evening, which was at nine. But I was a little late, I didn't cooperate with this, I was angry. So it was too late and they didn't put me on television. After that, a while after that, called uh, the radio. And they wanted to do, and I said, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not into it. I'm not speaking about it yet and I don't want to. And then called the television. And I said, no, you know, maybe later. I, al I also told the radio. No, it was the opposite. First the television and then the radio. So the radio said, but we want before the television. You know. So, uh, oh, that's that's nice. I look. <laughs> um, I'm I'm a member of the organization of uh, victims of terror in Israel, which works with Ivo. But I haven't been in touch with them a lot. It's not. I don't really. I didn't need it and. Uh, and then when my son, Daniel, which some of you knows, arrived to the age of bar mitzvah, um, we got mail that saying that he's invited to this organization, makes uh, one day for all the boys and girls at this age in, in Jerusalem, going there and uh, meeting many people and receiving presents and so on and so on, and, and uh, finishing this day in the, in the um, president's house. And uh, me and my husband, the, the, the day is full of, of speeches and, you know, everybody. And we thought, uh, maybe we won't go. But then my son, he wants to. <laughs> so I said, of course we go. I want to meet all these people. So we went. And eventually it was a very nice day. And after, when we came back, after a month or two, I get an invitation. We get an invitation to, the, to, to come to the camp in uh, in Canada, and I looked at it and I said, wow, where does all this good come suddenly, you know? So that's how, uh, and of course, uh, Daniel, we have, we have also a daughter. Danielle is almost 17 now, we have a daughter, she's 13 and a half, and she is, like if he's very open and friendly and everything, she's much more shy. Now she was, she was invited this year to come, and she, no way, Richard tried to tell her, come, uh, so unfortunately, maybe she will not come. I don't know. So when Daniel came to Canada when he was 13, what did it mean to you? What did it mean to me? Yeah. I don't know. It's, it was very nice that, um, you know, somebody recognized what I went through and makes an effort to, to do something good for, for my children. And uh, it was very warming. and. Uh, gave me a very good feeling. And when he came back, did you notice a difference in him? Um, yeah, yeah. He, he had wonderful memories. He kept wanting to go again and again. And uh, we also saw, we saw pictures. They have a web and, uh, and we could see how happy he was. And yeah, and he, he got mature a little bit. And yeah, I think it was, a, actually yesterday I went to the camp and they live in tents. And I said, oh, when you go to the army, you're going to have an easy time. You're used to it already. <laughs>
Yeah. No. Not like this, but uh, uh, I got uh, compensation from them. <laughs> no, but uh, um, at that time, the, the law was that uh, the compensation for these things is up to, listen very good, $20,000. That much. So, and they were, not, they were not very interested in giving this money, so in the end, we, we, had, to, uh, we had to say where we will go to court. So then in the end, there was a compromise, and I received uh, $18,000, which today, people can get millions for this, but then... Yeah. How do your children deal with your experience? How do you share your experience with them? That's a good question. Um, look, we don't speak a lot about this at home because for me, I always said, look, when I came back, somebody told me, somebody from the kibbutz told me, this is the most important thing, thing that ever happened to you. And for me, important is like it has a good connotation. And I said, no way. The most important thing that ever happened to me is that I fall in love and I had uh, my boyfriend. Maybe this is the most significant thing that ever happened to me, but not the most important. And I kept saying all the time, I'm not a victim. I was 24 when this happened. I had my personality. I had my thoughts. I had my life. And I'm not going to be uh, defined by this. So also in my home and in my life, it's not like uh, uh, I'm a victim all the time. There is no, uh, there's no picture of my, my companion girl. There is no corner of uh, you know, memory. Sometimes we speak about it, sometimes not. And, and uh, my, my uh, friend, my friends, uh, Memorial Day, they always do it, the family does it always on Friday afternoon. And they, it's back, it, it's far in the, in the north. So we were going there and being there and taking, after that, taking um, a Zimmer up there and staying there for, for the weekend and taking the children with us. But always it was, the, there was something in the, in the uh, Bet uh, cemetery. cemetery. And then sitting and, and eating and speaking and so. And, and then when my son arrived to the age of six, I started, he, my son is very bright and very, he hears everything. And, and I realized <laughs> he can understand now that something terrible happened, but he cannot understand that I'm okay and that, and we are a family that flies a lot I, I took consultation and we decided that it's better that he will not come with us now. So for a few years we stopped taking them. And for these few years it, it became a little bit a secret, which was uncomfortable and we didn't want it to be, but I thought he's too young for it and also his sister. And then when he was, you know, when he was 12, I think, he was 12, she was nine, we told them. And, uh, <coughs> That's when they heard about it. And they are, you know, even when they heard about it, I didn't tell them all the details in the beginning. I didn't, I just told them something happened and that's, and they slowly, slowly, they ask on their own time and. Uh, hmm? Thank you. Richard did it. Thank you all for listening. And I, but I forgot something. No, I just, I just wanted to say that the idea to come here 
was to say thank you for this, to this community and uh, to this organization for, for really, one morning I woke up and I, f I, I was so happy and I felt so, so uh, um, thankful that I told Richard, I want to come and tell my story and because I really appreciate all of that. So that's important for me to tell you. Well, Tamar, you mentioned what kept you going. I'm not sure, but you mentioned Emona, the song, and you mentioned your family. So I want to acknowledge your family who are sitting with us here tonight, your mother, Aura, Aviv, Hadas, and Ron, who have joined her, their sister and daughter here in this very, very special, inspiring mission that you have here in Montreal. And if I may add the following, the people sitting here tonight didn't come because they're curious. That's not what it is. It's not why they came and not why they listen. Every single one of them here is your brother and sister. I could feel that. Is your family. And it's it's a privilege that you have come here and shared your story, which shows each one will take what they take from the story. There's so much. It's so rich in so many layers. But one thing we have done, you have, again, united us in even a deeper way than before. So we thank you for that. Thank you. Can I sit down? <laughs> We've become very close over the last few years. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to share, uh, to make sure it gets on the microphone, we have to like pass this around. We're not so formal. By the way, everything at IVAO we do, everyone that's involved in IVAO is a volunteer, just so you know. <coughs> Aside from the community that contributes, the camps, the synagogues, all of us are volunteers. And I can tell you that when I'm in Israel, and we tell, now we have 100 families this year. It's just, even our, even our I, I just want to publicly thank our team in Israel. Everyone does this because we care about the kids. And we, it means so much to all of us that we have this opportunity to give these kids this kind of experience here. And I can tell you that when I'm over in Israel, as I've said to many people, it's incredibly embarrassing because the amount of gratitude and hospitality that's shown to me because, in a sense, I'm the representative of IVAO in Israel. But as I said before, it really is something that this whole community contributes. And I think the whole Montreal Jewish community should be proud of what we do at IVAO. Definitely. Now I get to tell my own Weinberg story, a very short story that connects to IVAO this year, so you understand how real IVAO is and the kind of families. You'll read, if you, when you pick up our magazine, if you, read, if, if you pick it up, and you, you'll read some of the stories that my good friend Joni Tansky wrote for Ive Out. Um, but I'm going to tell you my own Weinberg story that connects to this year. This is your, she's looking at, she's not sure what story I'm going to tell. By the way, whenever I'm in Tel Aviv, whenever I'm in Tel Aviv, the Weinbergs have become my tour guides. They take me to different parts of Tel Aviv because they want me to learn Tel Aviv. I'm often traveling around the country. So the first time they took me to this beautiful part of Tel Aviv called the Tachana. Does anyone know the Tachana? Yes. Yes. I highly recommend it. When you go to Tel Aviv, go to the Tachana. It's a beautiful redevelopment. It's the old train station, right? right? And it's the old train station. And that, there were two great moments I've had with, with the family, with, with Tamar and her husband, Michelle, and Daniel, and Ta Talia, the two kids. When I sat the first time, a couple of years ago, with Tamar, I remember she told me the story. I've heard the story from Tamar a few times. And I remember you said, because you mentioned whether you've shared it with Daniel and Talia, when she told me the story in the Tachana, it's hard to explain what this environment was like. It was like you could, it, it was the first time they had heard the details of the story. That was the first time, do you remember? Yeah. It was the first time because she said she was very reluctant to tell the story with the kids. It was the first time. The next time, or one of the next times in Tel Aviv, this is last year. They tell me they'd like to tell me, take me to the Sorona market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know the Sorona market? 
So this is probably, I think it was the trip, it was in, it was in the spring of 2017. And they tell me they want to show me the Serona market. Now I knew in the back of my, not in the back of my mind, I knew there had been something you, some of you may know, called the Serona market shooting that had taken place in June 2016. So this is less than a year after. And Tamar and Michelle, Tamar's husband, are, we're walking through the Serona market, and all of a sudden we get to Max Brenner's, which is the big food place in the Serona market. And Michelle starts to tell me a story, which, after you've heard this, it's hard to believe what Michelle was telling me. Michelle happened to be at a movie theater down the street. It's called the Cinematheque, right? Or, right. Michelle happened to be at a movie theater down the street. At the, and he was exiting the movie theater at the moment the shooting was happening in the Serona market. And as we're walking down this street, which is going into the Serona market, we're walking down the street, Michelle is very, Michel is like their son Daniel. He's very animated, right? <laughs> very animated. And Michelle's telling me, and I'm walking, and he didn't know there was a shooting. And what happened? If you've ever watched, you actually can watch, unfortunately, the video of the Serona market shooting. It was two shooters wearing black suits and ties. I don't know how, much, how many of you saw it. And as it turned out, Michelle's describing to me that as he's walking up the street from the movie, one of the shooters is running right towards him. He didn't know. He didn't know what had happened. He didn't understand this was one of the guys who had just shot up the Serona market. And he explains to me how the person runs by him, and then a policeman is following him and shoots him. And this is how close Michelle is to all of this. And the, the shooter was shot, and then Michel went to him, right? I remember Michel saying he went to him because he didn't realize who he was until the police yelled at him and said, go away, go away, because he was afraid he may have a suicide vest or whatever it is. So at that moment, I actually said to Daniel and Talia, I said, I'm not sure how much I should be hanging around with the Weinberg family. <laughs> I, said, I said, this is too much, like twice in a lifetime, right? Do you want to say something? Yes. My friends, they say it's luck to fly with me because I've already I'm I'm there from here from here. Yeah, because with me nothing will happen anymore. But when I when I uh, came to testify in the in the trial in in uh, Washington D.C., I met there a woman who came from Egypt. She was also a survivor and she came to testify. And she was um, at that time she was 40 years old. And she, she was not married because nobody in Egypt would marry her because she was bad luck. Ah, wow. Think about how these things are working. Well, <laughs> I'll consider tomorrow good so luck, good luck yeah. and Michelle. So Michelle finishes telling me the story of the Serona market or his experience when he was there as it just after it happened. And he was that close to his own terror attack. The person running towards him could have still had the gun. They actually had thrown the guns down. But he, Michel could have, I mean, it was again, by complete divine providence, he happened to be there at that moment. Mm -hmm. But obviously, aside from describing the, the shooting, the Serona market was a, one of the horrible tragedies in Israel in the last couple of years. There were four people killed during the Serona market shooting. One of them was a 39-year-old woman named Elana Nave. She had four daughters, and one of her daughters, sorry, is coming with us, will be here as part of the IBEL program this year. She'll be at Camp Massad. It was a very special case because when her mother was killed two years ago, she was actually bat mitzvah age. And so she couldn't come last year or the year before. It was just too difficult on the family. And so technically, she's actually too old to be part of our IVAL group. But I, we recognized, and all our Montreal people recognized, I called the camp. I said, there is no way that Lenoy Naba is coming to this community and is not going to be hosted by this community. 
So it's a reminder that some of the kids that we have coming on this program, we had a, a boy, Geffen Malamed, last year whose, boy, whose father was killed only a couple of years ago. There's a girl coming with Lenoy Nava to Masad. Her name is Enav Mizrahi. You may remember this event. Her father was killed. They were on their way to a Seder four years ago. She was in the car when her father was killed. She will be with us at Camp Masad as well. They're both Shomer Shabbat families. So this is who our Ival families are. These are who our kids are. So we feel we have a duty and a mission to show these families that we so greatly appreciate the sacrifice they have made in Israel because of the suffering that they have had to endure, as I said earlier, just for the sole fact that they live in Israel. So we're incredibly proud of what we do at IVA. We're incredibly pleased that you've all turned out here tonight to hear Tamar and to hear our, a bit about IVA as well. This is the first time, by the way, that IVA, I think, has ever done a public event where one of our actual terror survivors has actually spoken. So it's a first for IVA. And we hope we're a volunteer organization, so we need help. You'll see in the magazine, whether it's volunteering, donations, uh, this doesn't happen magically. Obviously, we, we need support. And so anyone's support is greatly appreciated. Um, so thank you very much. Just before we wrap up, we have a couple of gifts we'd like to give to Tamar. So just a second. I would ask all the, there's board members here. I'd like them to come up. Jack, Ben, Aaron, Neil. Jack, Jack, you're, you're, you're part of our, Jack Rosenthal. This is our IVAO sort of, these, these gentlemen here, and Joni, of course, are our IVAO, um, this is like the IVAO, uh, Alice Solomon. I want Alice just because she's been with us for, she's helped IVAO for 30 years. So Alice. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Joni. Joni, you should come up too. We need some. We're very low tech at IVA. We're going to have to have someone take a picture. So, first of all, um, on behalf of our, who's going to, Joni, you should come in the picture. I'll take a picture. Joni. So, first of all, I'm not, we have a gift. That Thank you. Very expensive. And, <laughs> and we have a special plaque that Tamar can take back to Israel, which says, uh, presented to Tamar Weinberg with our heartfelt appreciation for sharing your story with the Montreal community wow. from all of us at IVAO 2018. Can we get a picture? Someone will have a picture of this? Thank you very much. This I, I'm going to be, we say in Hebrew, Polania, like Polish. This was not necessary. <laughs> but thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, Tamar. Thank you everyone for coming.